For the first time on Zoo Tours, I brought you to the Sunshine State to explore the Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. Not far inside this wild world, we're first welcomed by one of the most diverse walkthrough aviaries out there, filled with flying colors that are found all over the world. But today, we'll be focusing on the Asian Gardens, opened as the Asian Domain in 1988. As part of a rejuvenation to what was a really outdated zoo, the gardens is a two-acre loop through a subtle temple-themed jungle and a zoo fanatic stream, giving a guarantee to get up close to this combination of rare tropical animals that other parks find difficult to obtain. And it used to start with rhinos, but now something that's not too far off from that. Malayan Tapers, a gem that's barely changed in 35 million years. A reclusive relative of the horse and rhinoceros with a streamlined body to hide in the forest overgrowth. With a prehensile trunk used for grasping food, detecting danger through scent, and even a snorkel. From several vantage points at your feet, there may be the world's largest lizard, the Komodo dragon. They have powerful venom. One bite will cause loss in blood pressure, which then leads to their victims to bleed to death. The Komodo can eat 80% of their body weight or over 100 pounds in one feeding. And if you're lucky, you might even get to see that here in Tampa. On their left is another guest accessible aviary. Though this time you're sort of encouraged to interact with blue-faced honey eaters and lorikeets. A small sociable parrot known for their beautiful plumage and eating techniques. Adapted with brush tip tongues used for gathering pollen and nectar from flowers. They flock in thousands and don't really shut up, but when browsing for food, they do subdue the chatter and take advantage of their green coloration to hide from competitors and predators. And let's say you do have a fear of birds and getting pooped on, you can watch the lorikeets safely from out here. Which brings us to the boardwalk, and viewable through the wire, wandering below, the Malayan tiger. Being one of the largest cats, they rely on hunting prey that is much bigger than themselves, willing to travel for miles to snag a hoofed animal that will sustain them for days. Like the Malayan taper, they inhabit dense vegetation that creates spotty light patterns on the forest floor, and though colorful, a tiger's pattern will help them blend into this environment, and that includes the spots behind their ears thought to be used for communicating with other predators. And when threatened, the tiger will twist their ears forward so the spots are exposed towards the front as an act of intimidation. Now they can't always outrun their prey, so the element of surprise is essential to their survival. But even so, only 5% of hunts are successful. From the 1800s to present day, the tiger population dropped by 95%. And though Zoo Tampa's Mata and Bazooey contributed with the cub, the way things are going, zoos might soon be the only place you can see a tiger. Now moving on to a mysterious animal that we are very lucky to see, the Lowland Anoa. A small, shy, wild cattle that's also known as the dwarf buffalo. Unlike most bovines, they like to spend their time alone outside of the breeding season. Despite their docile, or you could say cute, appearance, Anoas are actually very excitable and somewhat dangerous, being able to use their sharp horns as daggers, which are peculiar for their straight shape compared to the curved horns of other buffaloes. However, living on the island of Sulawesi, adults don't really have any natural predators, except Except, of course, us. Like their feline neighbors, thanks to hunting and habitat loss, only a few thousand exist in the wild. And I say we're very lucky to come across one because only seven AZA zoos care for the Anoa. And speaking of animals that you don't usually see in zoos, a mammal on the tiger's menu. Casey the Malayan Sun Bear from Arkansas. Weighing up to only 150 pounds, they are the smallest bear in the world, and that small size facilitates their arboreal lifestyles. Contrary to their name and the fact that he was so active on my visits, sun bears actually prefer to roam around in the moonlight. Yet their coat is still well adapted for the tropical rainforest, in this case the Florida humidity, as it is short enough to prevent overheating. Similar to most of their cousins, they are omnivores, but unlike them, sun bears have a 9 inch long tongue that's used to extract their diet from termite mounds and honey from a bee's nest. 
so they show no fear by climbing high and taking on stinging insects. But they, no surprise, face deforestation to make way for coffee, oil palms, and rubber plantations, along with poaching since their gallbladder is still used in traditional Chinese medicine. The only positive from this, however, is the sun bear is yet to be considered endangered. And going back to the island of Sulawesi, another fantastic walkthrough aviary, which in a good way has very limited viewing space for us. Though it's hard to spot almost everything in here, the stars are obviously and ironically the yellow-billed stork. While most birds rely on their vision to hunt, they instead use their sense of touch, swinging their slightly open beak in shallow waters, snapping it shut and swallowing whatever they catch. Now I say ironic because they're commonly found in the skies of East Africa and not Indonesia, but they do closely resemble the Asian painted stork. The yellow bills also live with 13 other creatures like the demois cell crane of China, southern bald ibis of South Africa, and if you hear a loud bark, look down in this corner and you might find Reeves moot jacks. No, they aren't dogs, but rather small deer that will set off a screeching barking sound when predators are nearby or if they're calling a mate. Together, they establish small territories with their pre-orbital gland located in front of their eye that deposits secretions containing pheromones. Other than their call, they also use their antlers and small tusks to defend their personal habitats. We've come across tigers, a mini buffalo, a deer that can bark, and this tour continues to get even better with the Indian rhinoceros. Now if you're caught up with the show Secrets of the Zoo, you would know that Jamie and Johnny, who lives in a semi-private space behind her, had many breeding attempts. Well, say hello to Baby Gronk. Born only in September of 2020, sharing the positive spirit and some physical aspects of strength, appropriately he was named after the Tampa Bay Buccaneers tight end Rob Gronkowski. He is his father's first calf and mother's fourth after again being pregnant for a year and a half. The Indian rhino contrasts their African relatives with their armor-plated appearance accentuated by lumps. This creates folds all over their body and are prone to parasites but are helped out by small birds that remove them. A calf is typically born at 120 pounds but may eventually reach 5,000 when fully grown. Gronk will likely nurse for a year and become fully independent by the age of two and in the wild since they are a solitary species would part ways with their mother. So not only do I highly recommend you make it down to Tampa to see him, but you can actually interact with his family if you sign up for the nose to horn encounter. Now with the cuteness out of the way, we're headed towards prehistoric times. In a semi-aquatic habitat once home to tapirs, bearded pigs, and tufted deer is now taken over by black pond turtles, giant Asian pond turtles, and if you didn't notice, the Indian gharial. At the usual length of 15 feet, they're one of the largest crocodilians in the world but are undoubtedly the most unique. Instantly recognizable by its narrow mouth equipped with 110 sharp interlocking teeth. Unlike the American alligator, their slender snouts are not meant to eat large prey like deer or turtles, but are suitable to catch fish and small birds. You'll notice that males have a bulbous structure at the tip of their snout that's called a gara, given the name after an Indian water pot of the same shape. It's not only used for show, but it also produces sounds and bubbles during courtship. Hunted for their skin, they almost became extinct in the 70s, and though they've made a bit of a comeback, the gharial numbers in hundreds, and therefore is still critically endangered. Next to them, probably one of the only felids with a puppy's eyes, the clouded leopard, the world's smallest big cat that benefits from life in the trees of China to Southeast Asia. Compared to other wildcats, clouded's have an advantage in hunting. It can rotate its ankles backwards so they can climb down a tree head first and even hang from its back feet, leaving their front paws free to catch prey below them. The other advantage comes from their mouth. They famously have the longest teeth relative to the size of its body than any other feline. They're the same size as a tiger's, which overall are 10 times bigger than a clouded leopard. Straight across is something small for something relatively big. The Burmese mountain tortoise. Well, one day they'll be big since they are the largest tortoise in mainland Asia and what used to live in there now cools off in the mud in here. 
The Visayan warty pigs, named for the islands where they're confined, and the pair of fleshy bumps on a male's face, which as attractive as it makes them, the warts are also thought to protect themselves from a rival male's tusk. Warty pigs were only recognized as a separate species in 1993 and quickly found themselves on the endangered species list. They roam on three Philippine islands, inhabiting the 2% of rainforest that's still there. And if you want to talk about rare animals, the warty pigs population is about 300 in zoos, but in the wild, that number is unknown. And judging from the incorrect signage, I'm guessing these pigs rotate from this to this trench with another pig. More specifically, the Babarusa, famous for their own elongated teeth that have unpredictable growth. But since Myrtle here doesn't have any showing, we'll discuss them at another time. But it should be worth noting that I did see her living with the tapers on one of my visits. And that completes the loop of this Asian garden, a collection that's hard to come by. But the rarities do continue next door at Zoo Tampa's own Florida Wildlife Center. Well, I hope you at least learned something today. And until next time, thank you for watching Zoo Tours.